You have a reputation. Yeah, I'm talking about you and you and you. You have a reputation. You have a reputa reputation for being generous. I'd like to give you some examples. The Afghan family. Kids food basket. Christmas joy offer. Ruth Sickle, burn the mortgage. <laughs> Next Sunday is the last Sunday for contributing to the Stuff the Bus campaign. There are 800 children in need of school supplies. So maintain your reputation. Be generous. Help out those students. Thank you. I think we can also take this opportunity to welcome back three of our members that have been conspicuously absent. And that's Marie. Welcome back, Marie. Thank you. And Randy. Good to have you here, Randy. And of course, my husband, that's special. He's back with us. So. <laughs> Praise the Lord for his healing powers. Now, please join me in the call to worship. The Lord is gracious and merciful. So
Father, in the presence of God, we are promised forgiveness and healing. Let us pray to God, who never ceases to love us. You know us better than we can be, Holy God. You cause us to serve others, and we stay in the coolness of our own homes. You send us to where the hopes of the earth, but when we are reluctant to leave our comfort zones, you feed us on the peace and joy of your word, but when we pull our chairs up to the tables of those who serve false promises. sending us out to bring hope and joy to all the world. Here, here.
hearts and minds to the hearing of your word, holy God. Open us to your truth. Humble us to your will. Amen. Our first reading this morning is found on page 332 of your Pew Bibles. 2 Kings 4, 42 to 44. And in some ways it's going to sound very familiar to you. And when AJ reads his part, you'll see how familiar it is. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. This man of God is Elisha, the prophet. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, give it to the people and let them eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He set it before them. They ate and they had some left according to the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading for today comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. Hear these words in the book that we love. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for all these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, There's a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in this place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to each of those who were seated, and so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This indeed is the prophet who is to come. When Jesus realized that they were about to take him by force and make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. Now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The seas became rough because a strong wind was blowing, and when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I could only imagine you've heard these stories countless times. These might even be some of the first stories about Jesus you heard when you were a child, and perhaps they were even the first stories you told to your children. In fact, the feeding of the multitude is one of the only events that happens in all four Gospels, and Jesus walking on water happens right afterwards in every Gospel except Luke, who doesn't tell us about Jesus walking on water. But I wonder how much this scene grips us. 
with its dependence on so many very unfamiliar details. So, I invite you to imagine this scene with me occurring in northern Michigan, more specifically on the beach of Mackinac City. Jesus had been preaching all day, and a huge multitude had gathered to hear him speak. There were 5,000 men, but including women and children, there were as many as 12 or 15,000 people. I don't know if you've ever been to DeVos Performance Hall to see a musical or another show, but it seats about 2,500 people. It is a very large venue, but Jesus' crowd was filled out five or six times over. This was a huge crowd, and it's getting to be dinner time, and there's no food in sight. Jesus looks over at Philip with a grin in his face and a glint in his eye, and he asks, how are we going to feed all these people? Excellent question. Philip has no answer, except to say that $15,000 would not put a dent in it. There are no good solutions, he thinks. Then Andrew piped up, I found a child with a lunchbox. <laughs> He's got a leftover PB&J and a bag of pretzels. <laughs> but uh, that, that wouldn't go very far, would it? Jesus responded, let's have everyone take a seat. Now, these shores are immaculate. Magnificent trees line the shore from left to right, and countless flowers are blooming just yards back, and all the while, waves are crashing gently into the shore. And everyone sat, waiting for what was about to happen, and hanging on Jesus' every word. Then Jesus took the little sandwich and the few remaining pretzels, and he thanked God for them. He praised God for this small provision. And then, he walked to each and every person and offered them the food, as much as they had need. And he never ran out. Abundance flowed from this offering. And after he had finished, he asked his disciples to gather up what was remaining of this boundless feast. It filled up twelve baskets, and none of it was lost. Just enough leftovers for each and every one of Jesus' disciples to take a basket. Take and remember. The people were amazed and tried to make him their leader, but he retreated and walked far away from them, leaving his disciples behind. And later that evening, these twelve men set sail for Mackinac Island from that beach, where they were staying. It was about an eight-mile trip, which should take only about an hour of sailing, but halfway there, there was trouble. A massive storm they had not known, they had not known was coming slammed into the boat and threatened to capsize them. Suddenly, they saw Jesus walking by. They froze as they witnessed their friend and teacher pass by them. And he looked back and said, I'm here. Don't be afraid. And suddenly they hit the shore, safe and sound. <coughs> I have a feeling this story often becomes normalized and domesticated in the ways we talk about it. But I hope this short retelling does something towards making it exciting and maybe even strange again. The Gospel writers seem to think that it says something very important about what sort of Savior Jesus is. So that begs the question, what sort of Savior is this? What kind of King is this? I want to bring your attention back to the kind of food that Jesus multiplied in this miracle. Barley loaves and fishes. These represent a very poor child's small sustenance. He was just barely getting by. This was certainly no feast, even for him alone. It was a simple traveling food for a poor boy. Functionally equivalent to a PB&J and a bag of pretzels today. And yet, Jesus takes this honest offering and brings forth abundance. In this moment of desperation and hunger for a meal, a moment of deep need, Jesus takes this little gift from the boy and turns it into a feast for a multitude. In this moment, the kingdom itself spills out of Jesus. He goes around to the crowd, handing each person more than they feed, inviting them to be filled by the generosity of the kingdom of God, both physically and spiritually. The kingdom of God, the king himself, display 
unending generosity and abundance here. Christ shows us that enough can come out of our moments of deepest need when our finitude is clearest. What we have is not enough, and yet even our not enough becomes enough in the hand of God. And even that not enough comes from the hand of God. We cannot fix the hunger crisis and house all those without houses, yet our acts of faith empowered by the Spirit, are not enough, can become more than enough. At Western, one of our emeritus professors, Tom Bogart, believed this, and worked with the local nonprofit Community Action House to establish the community kitchen in 1992 to serve free hot meals to those in need every day. Those hot meals are still served there every single day, provided through generous donations by the broader community to Community Action. In the face of great need, God has provided endlessly to both Western and the unhoused community of Holland. Countless people benefit from this one idea in God's provision every day. I myself have eaten there almost every day since I moved to West Michigan in 2021. Just as in the Gospel story, in the face of our not enough, God has created enough. And after this great miracle, Jesus does something that may seem really rather strange. He asks the twelve to gather the leftover food. One might wonder if he wanted to save it for later, which, again, would be really odd given that he has shown his ability to make more immediately prior to this. But friends, this gathering has little or nothing to do with Jesus' stinginess about food and making sure it was all accounted for. He had food in abundance and could certainly make more. He is God. But it's more important to pay attention to the details here. Here again. From the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. Now, there are a lot of twelves in the Bible. Jacob had twelve sons, there were twelve disciples, and perhaps most relevantly, there were twelve tribes in Israel. All of which had been scattered following the exile to Assyria and Babylon. Scholars often point out that this gathering may be in reference to those twelve tribes of Israel. In gathering up these fragments, Jesus is symbolically, through the disciples, gathering up the lost children of Israel and all the children of God, so that none may be lost. Jesus' intention is to show both his provision and protection of all of God's family. He is bringing the family of God back together after so many years of it being scattered and lost. Jesus will provide both food and safety to all of God's children, and none will be left without him. Jesus here is symbolically stating his intention to bring the family of God back together, as he will finally fully accomplish at the cross. But returning to our story, the crowd quite correctly interprets this as a sign that Jesus is the prophet foretold of in Deuteronomy 18. But Jesus also knew that they wanted him to be a rather different sort of king than he intended to be. They wanted a king who would multiply weapons of war rather than an impoverished boy's food. They wanted a king who would attack rather than gather up and protect. In short, they wanted a king who would go to battle against Roman rule, rather than reconstitute the family of God through vulnerability and weakness. And so, he withdrew from the crowd to pray alone on the nearby mountain. This king chose intimacy with his father, rather than political pursuits and violent gain. He chose rest. Now later that evening, the disciples headed to the other side of the sea, but a huge storm overtook them terrified. After being fed an abundant feast of bread and fish, they found themselves in great danger without their teacher. Though they were excellent sailors, indeed many of them had been fishermen on this very sea before they were called by Jesus, this storm, this storm threatened to overtake even them. And here, and they looked up, and they saw Jesus walking past them. And here, Jesus claims his identity. It is I, that is, I am, the divine name used throughout the Old Testament. 
I am who I am. Have no fear. In the very moment he claims his identity in, this, in, in the center of a terrifying storm, Jesus again gives the command most often repeated in the text of Scripture. Do not be afraid. With me, you are safe. None of you will be lost. Not that their fear is not valid or seen. They had every reason to be afraid, and they were very near unto death. But just as Jesus gathered up the children of God symbolically in the baskets earlier that evening, Jesus here gathered up the disciples and delivered them safely to shore. He is the kind of king who will never let us go. Jesus is the king who shows up and offers abundance and safety. Even when things look bleak, when rent is due and the cabinets are empty, when you have to choose between the gas bill and the electric bill, when your relationship with your boss is growing frosty and you're not sure if you'll have a job next week, even when the news from the doctor is bleak and the medical bills keep piling up, Somehow, some way, God promises to keep us safe. Despite our total inability to change the chaos around us, Jesus, is the, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we are safe in his loving arms. And none of us will be lost. Even when we have to make those hard choices about bills. Even when you are laid off. Though all we have may simply not be enough in the face of the great need in front of us, Jesus promises abundance. Even though we often cannot see it, and all that's left is a pb and and some pretzels, in God's hands, that just might be enough. We remember this when we approach the table. We see that in his broken body, here, Jesus offers us abundance and safety wholeness, and security. When we cannot see it, we trust that we are never alone. We trust that we are held in the loving arms of Jesus and that we will be gathered up in his arms and that none of us will be lost. We trust in the promise of Jesus that we are safe in his kingdom of abundance and security. Here at the table, we anticipate with eager longing hold fast to the sure promise that God will not fail to bring us into his kingdom at last. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll now sing our responsive song, number 733, We Are All One in Mission. <laughs>
gratitude to God for all our blessings, let us bless others with a portion of all we've been given. Let us present our offerings to God. I think it would be 
be interesting to see Paul in his nursing uniform. <laughs> it's the shoes. <laughs> to join you in that because they see the juxtaposition of the 50 years in your words of thank heaven she put up with you for that. <laughs> so, yeah, just in um, her Thanksgiving for our friend Jim and some of her yet another serious medical procedure. He's been through a lot. I had another one this week and it seems like everything's okay. So, Thanksgiving to that, our friend Jim. And Sue, I didn't want to mind your names, I'm sorry. Your friend who? Jim. Jim. Okay. Thank you. BJ. I'm sorry, Betty Jo. I would like to share two happy occasions. I don't really need prayer for these, but uh, I am finished with Bell Palsy, thank you. Yes. Oh. And now the is my old mouth. <laughs> and I'm very happy about that. Also, I have now reached David's age. <laughs> <laughs> he and I are the oldest people in the congregation. We, I just turned 94. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord and we pray for more years to come. We love you, Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we bring before you.
many thoughts, desires, wishes, caring, much caring, and ask that this Thursday you help me read through the tests and things that she comes out well and has a new lease on life. And Michaela's sister in law, Julie, healing her leg broken so badly. We thank you, Lord, for the joy of sharing longevity and long times together. We look to you, these marriages. Show me what wonders you can work with the union of man and wife for 50 years. We pray for our friend, Jim, who has become a friend now through prayer, for healing and a future. And Lord, we thank you for David and BJ in their long life with us their sharing of their joys, and we look to their future. Thanks for the healing of the Bell's palsy, which was so terribly painful. Cindy and her travels keep her safe as she travels there. Thank you for her arrival here. And we pray for healing for brothers Paul and Tom and the fact that they could get together and, and live in love. We pray for all of those, Lord, who are suffering in war-torn countries, who know not where their next bread is coming from. May others break the loaves for them and see that they have a future of joy and sharing instead of heartache and loss. There are so many in this country, Lord, who suffer, not just from personal problems, but those imposed by the elements outside, the floods, the fires, the anger. Please give our nation peace and individuals to love one another and care for one another with your love. We are so grateful in this congregation, Lord, that we join as a family to let your love surround us and uphold us. And that individually and corporately, we feel comfortable in this atmosphere of care, prayer and caring and joy. You have blessed us, Lord, so many times over. And we thank you by saying your special prayer that you gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Will you join me in our responsive charge with me? Rooted in Christ's love, we seek to grow in love for God and neighbor. This love is the work of our hearts to care and be cared for, of our souls to know and be known, and of our minds to learn and to teach, and our strength to do justice and so on. 
friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.